Well, howdy y'all, and welcome to Old Hillbilly Horror Podcast. Not my story, but my grandfather's actually who served during Vietnam. Now he's never been one to really share his stories and things with anyone, but he will sometimes. He recently, just in the last couple of years, noticed that I took a liking to cryptozoology and things of that realm. After learning that it's even a thing, he began to tell me how during the Vietnam War, which again he served in, a part of the platoon he was in was attacked by these large 10-foot tall reptilian crocodilian creatures. They killed at least eight of his men. His story terrified me when he told me it, and so I'll share it with you. He said that his platoon had been on a long and grueling march to the jungle. They were really close to where they were going, but had one more obstacle to go through, a river that would take at least half a day to cross with all their gear. They were already in the midst of a very thick part of the jungle, and with their current location, it would be tougher. So they waited for nightfall before crossing. There were Viet Cong soldiers in the area, and they wanted to wait for them to pass, everybody except for the point man who had gone ahead of the group to scout out the crossing. He said that after about an hour or so, he returned with wild, terrified eyes, asking if they could get across without making too much noise due to there being something large in the river. Well, my grandfather said they did their best, but it was still quite noisy when they got in the water. He heard this strange, almost trumpet-like noise he described in the distance, sounding like it was coming from the direction of the river. At first, they thought it might be a kind of animal or something, but after a few seconds, it became clear that there were too many weird things about these noises that did not pinpoint back to any animal. So they simply kept moving. By the time they got to about the halfway point, night had fallen, and because of this, my grandfather said he only saw one dark shape in the river as it made its way under them, disappearing after about a second or two. He said that besides that one moment, nothing too much seemed out of the ordinary besides the noises, but you could tell everybody was very uneasy. Once everybody got across the river and onto land again, his point man set up to keep watch for a few moments while everybody else tried to get a bit of sleep. He claims that five minutes into the guard shift, nothing seemed wrong at all, but then he saw two or three of these dark shapes in the water that began to ascend out of the water. Quick note. This section that they were in was a very thick part of the jungle. He told me even the captured Vietnamese refused to travel through here, and when questioned, they acted very scared. They knew. Anyway, he said that the first thing he did was wake everybody up, and for some reason, his point man wouldn't respond. After a second of shock, he realized this as well as the fact that their point man was no longer on post, but had now been dragged into the water. My grandfather said that at this point, Everybody began to panic, some reaching for their guns while others tried to get a better look at whatever was in the river. It wasn't long before they realized that this thing had killed off half their men, including their point man, taken in their sleep. He said there were three or four of these creatures in the water, coming out and going back in. Everybody started shooting at them, but it didn't do much other than make things worse. At first, they thought it was just because there were so many men shooting, and then he noticed that some of the bullets would go through one of these creatures, and after a second or two, another creature on the same side as the other one would rise up out of the water and eat what was left of the comrade on shore. He said everybody tried to run away at this point, but some didn't make it back into the jungle in time before watching everything they had ever had become eaten by these things. They went into hiding for hours until dawn finally came around. Apparently, during this time, he wasn't sure if he was awake or dreaming when more than once he heard screams sound off in the distance. He knew those were his teammates being eaten and torn alive. He told me that none of this seemed real if he closed his eyes, but in the daylight, it was a different story. He told me that in a few short hours, they finally heard a chopper in the distance and began to signal them with their gun mags. He said that when they got to where my grandfather and some of his friends were at, they were all that was left. There were just bones and bits of meat and flesh from these creatures. He told me he never returned to that part of the jungle again, and making the shortcut was a huge mistake. He told me this story about ten years ago. It still keeps me up at night sometimes, thinking about what happened. This is the only time my grandfather would ever talk about running into large humanoid crocodilian creatures, and now these weren't just regular crocodiles. These were something out of a nightmare. They had a taste for human flesh.
approximately three times a month. With occasional fluctuations, I experience a pronounced energy presence in my room. This sensation often triggers my cat to vocalize and act as though it's observing an unseen entity, although this behavior typically subsides shortly afterward. These occurrences have repeated multiple times. Furthermore, during nighttime, I frequently encounter a peculiar sensation of a small hand touching my waist. I also perceive the feeling of someone walking on my bed, accompanied by a distinct sense of pressure on the mattress and a heightened energy ambience in the room. I'm left wondering about the nature of these experiences. Could they be indicative of a benevolent spirit, a malevolent entity, or even the possibility of extraterrestrial involvement? Basically, I'm doing what a normal person would do around this time. I'm asleep and well, suddenly, I'm woken up by two loud knocks that sound human on my window. Please note that my window looks out onto an enclosed and locked in back patio. Therefore, nothing should be able to access it. But anyways, here I am. I'm startled as F and too freaked out to look. Eventually, after about three minutes, I decide to go look as I need to plug back in my stuff, as this was right after a thunderstorm. And well, when I look out, there's absolutely nothing there, no signs of anything at all. And well, in the morning, I went to the other side of my window to find absolutely nothing, no back door unlocked. No signs of activity, absolutely nothing. And well, after this, I decided to pull out my phone and type this out in an attempt to debunk this. Really sorry if this was confusing. About a year ago, my significant other and I decided to go camping after she told me she'd never been before. Well, this former Boy Scout found a spot, packed his pack, and decided to give her the camping trip of a lifetime. We got to the site, left the envelope with cash for the overnight fee at the empty cabin, and drove into the woods. There were sites all along the paths, but some were taken. Seeing as she wanted to be as removed as possible, we decided to turn left and go up a steep incline to see if there were sights at the top. Well, what I saw will haunt me till the day I die. Not more than 10 feet in front of the car, after I slam the brakes, is a giant black bear on its hind legs and looking straight at us. No one blinks. After a minute, he gets down in a huff, turns around, and scampers off. A few minutes after that, my significant other and I break out in screams of terror and floor it back to the edge of the campsite. Fast forward to that night, we'd settled down a bit from our encounter and prepared to go to sleep. We'd chosen a site right next to a stream so as to have it lull us to sleep. Big mistake. We're both cuddling and falling asleep when suddenly we hear a splash in the stream. We both bolt upright, both thinking of the same animal that we are now realizing might be thirsty and nearby. Our car is parked just 20 feet from the tent and we consider making a sprint for it before here another few splashes in the water, followed by a grunt. Well, if the splashing didn't do it, the noise did. Eager to make a raucous, I sound the alarms on my car and scream F you as loud as I can. We then nope the F out of the tent, dive into the car, and drive off, leaving everything behind. We drove around for about ten minutes of terror after that, plotting next moves and discussing our certainty of having just avoided death. Eventually, we decide to return to the campsite, throw everything into the trunk as fast as humanly as possible, and yeet it to the open road. We then went back to my house, reset up the tent in our fenced-in backyard right behind the porch, and went to sleep. I work as a field biologist and spend a lot of time outdoors. One summer I was spotlighting for ferrets in a national park which required me to follow a trail on a GPS and shine a high-powered flashlight around in the middle of the night, looking for any eye shine reflecting back at me. The park is a dark night preserve, meaning there are no other artificial lights and it gets seriously dark. Even with the spotlight, a lot of details end up washed out and difficult to determine. I was sweeping an area when I noticed a green eye shine by a boulder. I got excited thinking I'd found a ferret. I radioed to command and slowly began to approach. I thought I was seeing two small eyes close together, but actually I was seeing one single eye, which became apparent when a massive head swung around and focused its other eye on me. Turns out that boulder was actually the body of a large bison, and I was standing less than 10 feet from its snout. In the middle of the rutting season, I just quietly radioed command and slowly backed away as it stared me down the entire time. 
I gave them a wide berth going around it, and I think I was lucky that it was either too tired or too unsure of the strange bright light to attack me. My name is Clark Stacy. I was born and raised in the deep Everglades of Florida, a place where many city slickers have deemed uninhabitable, but a country boy like me can find solace in the lush greenery and plentiful wildlife. From the birds to the boas, I was a friend of the flora and fauna. The relationship was, on occasion, not mutual. The Skeeters and Nosians were dreadful. The nearly daily rains were unbearable. There was a man eating clam in our backyard. Okay, maybe not that last one. But I do have some messed up tales from the forest. I'll get it out of the way right now. My parents divorced when I was too young to approach the situation rationally, but old enough to know what it meant. In short, I thought it was my fault. That's just about when I started going on adventures through the thick brush and humid swamps. It was the only way I could really take my mind off of home stuff and put it on keeping my ass alive. But enough about me. I know why you came here. Have you ever heard the song Gator Country by Molly Hatchett? It's about Florida. Hell, I've probably seen more individual alligators than I have human beings. One drizzly day, I ventured out about a mile from my backwoods home through the dank forests. I found a clearing, about 30 feet in diameter, with the prettiest daisies and petunias I had ever seen. As I stepped into the clearing, the rain subsided and the sheer Florida sun caressed and massaged my waterlogged skin. As I basked in this heavenly feeling, I heard a heavy rustle in the tree line. I went from pure ecstasy to a dead standstill. Just about anything could have made that noise, and half of the things it could have been were capable of killing me. For reasons I can't really explain, I wanted to take that 50-50 chance. It was shortly after the divorce, and I felt myself completely numb and invulnerable to danger. Mere feet away from the source of my curiosity, I heard a soft, gravely voice. Clark. Terror gripped the very fiber of my being, and I felt every my every muscle tense up. I leapt away from the thick brush just in time, as a full-grown gator lashed out and tried to catch me in his gaping maw. When I say full-grown, I mean at least 16 feet long, and as fat as those folks in line at Walmart. I ran like a man hopefully only has to run once or twice in his life, with his life on the line and adrenaline coursing through his veins. I raced through the overpowering greenery, collecting nasty cuts from the razor-sharp palm fronds. I got home and was interrogated by my mom about why I was near covered in blood and breathing like a maniac. I explained that I saw a gator and split. She said that, Them's is more afraid of you as you is of them. Yeah, right. Now, after that experience, any rational person would stop going into deep woods alone. But I'm not a normal person, and that experience was far from the scariest. Once, during winter, I was exploring a little closer to home. I discovered a banked creek under a thick canopy. I quickly checked my phone's map to see what body of water it connected to, only to find that it wasn't on the map. That should have been enough to turn me around and send me home, but I was feeling adventurous. I wasn't about to get frazzled by some pathetic, uncharted creek, so I hopped down to the bank and started walking along the sandy slopes. It only took me three minutes of walking to find a large carved out cavern, the kind an alligator would sleep in during the colder months. I saw a decent sized stone in the creek and got the worst idea of my life. I picked up the stone and chucked it into the moist, dark abode. What I heard was not a sound a gator is capable of making. It sounded more like a silverback gorilla whose genitals were just ripped off with a pair of needle nose pliers. The sound reverberated in my lungs and shook my body to its core. I bolted along the bank with a pace that could put Usain Bolt to shame. I looked over my shoulder to see whose slumber I had interrupted, and I truly wish I hadn't. I saw a humanoid figure, standing at maybe ten feet tall, covered in matted, auburn fur. It bellowed once again. I found where I had entered the creek's shores and flew home. That was the last time I ever went out into the wilderness. Me and Mom recently moved to the suburbs to the north of the Everglades, and I could not be happier. But sometimes, while laying at night, I feel a strange attraction to the beasts of my true home. I am forever haunted by this experience. It was April 1977. Two other young guys and I were in a juvenile detention center in Virgin, Vermont. 
It was way out in the country and we had made plans to escape that day. We asked for passes to walk across campus to the infirmary. Then when we got outside, we ran through the apple fields, up along the creek and headed north. At one point, a bull chased us out onto a tree fallen in the water. We finally got away and continued running for what seemed like hours. It was a heart pounding, drenched with sweat ordeal, going through brush fields and a slightly wooded area. We were very tired and running sloppy when all of a sudden, what sounded like a helicopter was overhead. We ran under a tree and a big shadow went over us. We looked up. A giant creature landed on a thick branch. We just saw its back at first. It looked like a person's back, but like a bodybuilder's, with rippling muscles and long legs. We were trying to figure out what it was. It was about five to six feet tall. When its head turned completely backward, these huge red orangish round eyes that seemed to be glowing were staring right at us. They had a hypnotic effect. We were all frozen in fear as it looked at us like prey, and it seemed to be looking for the weakest one. All of a sudden, the branch broke from the weight of this big creature, but its claws were locked on and those huge wings unfolded. The wind from those wings was very strong, and it carried the branch up over us and dropped it right in front of us. Then it turned its body while hovering above us. I yelled, grabbed a branch, waved it, and made lots of noise. It looked a little bewildered and very quietly turned away and glided off without hardly making a sound. I believe it thought we were injured prey and probably hunted other animals like that. I also believe it was trying to scatter us by dropping the tree limb nearby. It was a huge. My native people's owl legend calls them big hoots. They had horns like horned owls. It was brown with a grayish speckled underbelly, huge claws that could grab a person, and an enormous beak. I think this is what people call the Mothman. One of the guys hung himself a few months later. He was really freaked out after the encounter and turned himself into the authorities. His name was Jim. I believe if we were not hiding from the helicopter we thought was overhead, it would have snatched Jim. He was the weakest and lagging behind. It did seem to be concentrating on him when it was staring us down with those big orange red glowing eyes. I have been telling this story for over 40 years. Most people think I am crazy when I talk about an owl with a 10 foot wingspan. I'm from Clearfield, Pennsylvania. My friend and I used to go to a local train bridge down from the VFW and hang out at night. It was a peaceful place to go for a short walk. We went down one night and kept having strange vibes about it. We reached the bridge and paused for a moment and then walked halfway out on the bridge. We were there for about 10 minutes, talking and laughing, and then a huge rock flew off the hillside and hit the water so hard that it hit the bottom of the river. I heard it hit the other rocks on the bottom. It did not roll off the hill, it was thrown. There was no other noise until it hit the water. Anyway, we both paused and shined our lights to the other side and didn't see anything. So we just got up and left because I wasn't hanging around. We got off the other side heading back to the truck. We then heard a wood on wood knock and I'm a pretty big and fearless guy, but my butt got the hell out of there as fast as I could. I still hunt white-tailed deer down there despite what happened. I've got a story for you and I don't know what it is. Time travel, time slip, I don't know. My friend lives 400 miles away from me. She's a girl, but it's nothing romantic. I was at home in Saskatoon, Saskatchewan, and I had a couple of glasses of wine. I fell asleep on my couch watching a football game. So I woke up at 2.30 a.m. because the dog jumped on me and wanted to go outside and do her business. So I did that, and then I went to bed. I got a phone call about 7 o'clock in the morning from my friend Rhonda, and she said to me, Why did you leave without telling me you were going? And I said, What are you talking about? And she says, You were here last night, remember? And I said, What? She said, I was sitting in my kitchen crying because she and her boyfriend, she told me, had broken up. And you had spent the night comforting me. I said, Rhonda, I'm at home. I'm 400 miles away. She said, No, 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 you're pulling my leg. She said, Now I'm mad at you. You're telling me you don't believe me and you were here anyway. She decided to move back to my home city not long after that night. And get this, I walked into her house to help her pack. And when I stepped into her house, I'd never been there before. It was like, oh my God, I've been here before. 
Every hair on my body stood at attention. It was like somebody dumped cold water on me. And get this, she even said to me, don't you remember that at about 2.30 a.m., you had to take Jessie, my dog, to do her business? So, I don't know what that was all about. Was it a ghost story or time travel? And Rhonda and I have talked about it ever since. It's like we are scared to talk about it because it both sends shivers up our spine. This happened in June 2016. The light of the day was starting to fade. We were driving to my mother's house and the small bridge on RT 313 was closed. So we turned left and went through the town of Federalsburg, Maryland. We then turned right trying to find a detour. I had just mentioned how we were making good time because I looked at the clock, it was 8.30 p.m. We came upon a very dark wooded area on the road. My mom said, wow, that is really dark. That is the last thing either of us remember. Then the next thing we knew, we looked at the clock. It was 9.25 p.m. It literally felt like seconds before it was 8.30. My 21-month-old daughter had been fussy right before the woods, but she was now very quiet. The dogs had been panting, but were now still and quiet. Everything was eerily quiet. We felt very disoriented and realized we were miles from where we originally were and in the totally wrong direction. Based on my memory, my good sense of direction, and my mother's knowledge of the area, it made no sense to be where we were. I then noticed a burning bump in the back of my head behind my right ear. My mother felt very numb and extremely disoriented. We both felt as though we had a sunburn, a hot, tight feeling on our faces. She then noticed a bump in her head in the same spot. They looked like fresh needle marks. We drove to my mother's house in Seaford, Delaware in shock and disbelief at what just happened. After arriving home, we experienced headaches, neck aches, and feeling shaky. However, the swelling behind the ear had down on both of us. I was unable to find a mark on my daughter. We are upstanding citizens, and this is not a hoax. Something very strange happened to us that night, something we will never forget. We are thankful we had each other to share our experience with because it defies logic. Is it possible that we're experienced an alien abduction or a time slip? I can't believe that I say that because I have never believed in those possibilities before that evening. My dad recently told me this story and I was just amazed. I thought you would like to hear it. When I was young, about three or so, I was hospitalized and near death. I had a fever that just would not break and was passed out for most of the hospitalization. My dad, who has always been religious, wanted the hospital's priest to come say a prayer for me. So, the priest comes to pray for me, but something's not right about the guy. He never gives his name and has no Bible. He says the entire prayer in Latin and blesses me. Now, my parents aren't married yet, and since the priest is there, they ask why they haven't been able to have another child yet. They had been trying for about a year with no luck. The priest tells them that they won't have another child until they're married. The priest leaves after that, and an hour later, my fever breaks. The next day, the hospital's priest comes to the room to say a prayer for me. My dad is confused and tells the man that someone had already come the day before to which the man replies that no priests were on duty the day before. He checked with all of the hospital staff and their visitation book and everything. Nothing turned up. No priest was in the previous day. He searched for years to find this priest that prayed for me, and he never found a single trace of him anywhere. A month after my mom and dad got married, my mom got pregnant with my brother. So, we'll never know who the mysterious man was, but I like to think he's my guardian angel, and he still remains with me. To this day, my dad still has found no record of him, not even someone who looks like him. Someone was looking out for me that day, though. I just wish I knew who. It's not exactly a hiking story, but right when I graduated high school, before me, three of my close friends, and one of those friends' girlfriend, went off to different schools. The military, we decided to go camp at Yellowstone. We were still early in the season, so there was nobody at our campsite. The first two days we drove and hiked around, looking at geysers and springs and all the natural wonder, and our nights we spent by the fire in shorts and t-shirts getting drunk. Thanks to one of our friends being a camp food connoisseur, we ate a lot of amazing food that I didn't even know could be made by campfire. 
The third night started like the previous two. It was warm, and we were drinking, and all was well. I woke up at around 3.30 in the morning because there was something wet and cold on my face. Turns out it snowed so hard in the two hours we'd been asleep that the tent I was in collapsed. The wet and cold was the tent's roof on my face. I woke everyone up, and we dug each other out and reset our tents. I figured now was as good a time as any to walk over to the bathroom, which was I'd say about the equivalent of two blocks away from our campsite. I should note, I would not consider myself a woodsman. I'm comfortable in the outdoors, probably more than most people. At that time in my life, I was an avid fisherman and a competent hunter, but I was very concerned about the wildlife. Bears in particular. There are signs everywhere in Yellowstone about the wildlife that will kill you. Don't touch the bears, they will kill you. Don't touch the bison, they will kill you. Don't touch the deer, they will kill you. Hell, there are signs that even tell you not to touch the ground, because you could fall through and be acid boiled to death. Each sign comes complete with the bathroom guy illustration of why each thing is dangerous. The bison one I remember most is great, featuring a blocky bison tossing a guy into the air. The bison had speed lines behind it. I remember that very clearly. Anyway, I'm walking to the bathroom. It's dead quiet, and there's about four inches of heavy, wet snow on the ground. All I can hear is my footsteps, and then, as I walked, I started hearing something behind me. It sounded like much more careful footsteps, like something was conscious of the noise it was making as I moved through this kind of wooded area. I would take a few steps and pause, listening, and sure enough, there was this pat, 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 and then it would stop. I could see the brick bathroom structure, which was big enough for a men's and women's bathroom, with each bathroom having, I'm guessing, for the women's room three stalls in it. So I take the F off, sprinting the last 100 or so feet. I fly through the door, slip and crash onto the floor, and then scramble to slam the door behind me and press myself against it. I thought for sure that a bear, or maybe a mountain lion, was stalking me through the trees, and that I had just barely gotten away. I could only hope that my friends were as aware as me, and would be able to get in the trucks or whatever. So there I was, sitting on the bathroom floor with my back pressed against the door. It was cold, it was dark, I was wet, and still very much freaked out. I checked my watch. I'd been bracing the door for about 15 minutes. I decided it'd probably be okay to stand up. Just as I stood up, there was this big thump and the door knocked against me. I screamed, both out of shock and because some part of my animal brain was like make noise, become large. There were loud noises coming from the other side of the door, and so I just carried on shouting and pressing against the door. Turns out it was my friend Nick. When I realized it was him, I sheepishly held the door for him and asked if anything followed him, and explained what I was doing. He said he didn't hear anything on his way in, but that didn't mean I was crazy for thinking something tried to follow me. Now a pair though, and emboldened, we decided we had to get back to the campsite and warn our other three compatriots. We set out slowly, carefully listening after our steps, straining to hear or see anything. We had flashlights, and the moon was clear and bright off the snow, but it felt like every tree hid something with teeth. It was then that I heard it again. I grabbed Nick's shoulder and he nodded, saying, Yeah, yeah, I heard it too. We paused, listening and watching. I was squeezing my flashlight so tight I could feel the metal gritting into my hand. We heard it again, closer this time, but we still didn't see anything. Do we run or what? I half whispered, half shouted, and the way that you do when you recognize you should be quiet, but can't contain the urgency of the statement. I don't know. I don't think so, said Nick. Among the five of us, I was the only one that wasn't an Eagle Scout. If Nick didn't know what to do, then I figured we were just done. I just thought that whatever came out of the dark was going to get bopped directly in the eye with my flashlight before it made a meal of me. Pat, pat. It happened again. This time, right in front of me. I knew what the noise was now. It was clumps of wet snow falling out of the trees. Idiot is not a strong enough word for what I felt like. Me and Nick laughed it off, both making fun of me, but also relieved we didn't have to fight for our lives on some campground. Later that day, we saw wolves hunting elk way off in the distance. We saw the Grand Prismatic Spring and the various geysers and springs in the basin around it. A ranger came to our campsite and said that a bear had been seen in the area. 
and we needed to be extra careful about putting out food and trash away tonight, but nothing came of it. It was a pretty good trip. I'm genuinely concerned for my mental well-being after a recent unsettling incident in my home. I've considered sharing my experience in a post, both here and on our mental health. However, I'm hesitant about the latter, as I fear some might rush to diagnose me with conditions like schizophrenia or bipolar disorder. Up until now, I haven't displayed any signs of mental instability or depression. Apart from a brief period of sadness about external issues that occurred several years ago and left no lasting effects, I'm currently in my 20s, attending university, and the past few years have generally been quite positive, with some good news regarding my career and relationship. I apologize for the lengthy introduction, but I wanted to provide context and convey the shock I'm currently experiencing. I recently witnessed unexplainable activity, and since the only response I've received from those close to me is, you're crazy, I'm seeking others who may have had similar experiences or insights. Here's what happened. It was around 11 p.m., and I had just returned home from a choir session. While I wasn't particularly tired, I was eager to relax in bed and catch up on a Netflix series I had been looking forward to. I hurriedly made my way home without paying much attention to my surroundings. It wasn't until I stood in front of my door that I realized it was wide open. I live in an area where it's customary to leave doors open until late at night or until every family member is home. It's a close-knit village where everyone knows each other, and each home is enclosed by fences with a garden, making it easy to spot any potential intruders from a window. Returning to the story, I reached inside the entrance to trigger the light sensor and adjust the triangular device, I'm not sure of the English term for it, that my family uses to prop the door open. However, the entrance and the stairs leading to the apartments remained in darkness. Despite my eyes being accustomed to the darkness, I noticed that the door to my family's apartment was also wide open at the end of the few steps in front of me. This situation unnerved me, but what happened next was even more unsettling. I suddenly felt extremely dizzy, as if I were intoxicated, and I stumbled backward outside, losing my balance on the doorstep. That's when I saw a figure emerging from my apartment, standing before me for a few moments, and then ascending another set of stairs. The figure had long hair, but I couldn't discern any other details due to its black silhouette. Its movements were peculiar, as if its legs weren't moving normally, but instead sliding up the steps. My stomach churned with fear. I became convinced that there were intruders in my house, and I grew increasingly worried for my brother, who lived in the apartment above mine and was at home that night. I was afraid that the intruders might catch him off guard. In a state of panic, I backed away from the house and rushed to the gate, frantically ringing my brother's doorbell. He answered shortly after, asking if I had forgotten my keys. I hesitated for a few seconds, unsure of what to say. Finally, I asked if our parents were home. They were not. I inquired if he had friends over. He replied in the negative. I cautiously returned to the entrance and listened for any sounds, but there was nothing. A few minutes later, my cat approached me, seeking attention, and then entered the house. Strangely, the lights on the stairs immediately came on. I stood in my garden for a while, feeling bewildered, frightened, and on the verge of fainting. I was sweating profusely. Summoning my courage, I entered the house clutching my keys as a makeshift defense. I reached my brother's floor without encountering anyone or anything unusual. I peeked inside and, upon seeing my brother's family on the couch, simply bid them good night. I rushed down to my own apartment, locked the door, and meticulously checked every room. That night, I cried intensely because, for a brief moment, I genuinely believed there was an intruder. I was scared and confused. I still have no idea what actually transpired, and each attempt to rationalize it leaves me even more perplexed. I hope to receive feedback and am willing to answer questions, as long as they're not too personal. I kindly request that only serious comments be shared, as I'm genuinely concerned. Thank you. This occurred in the spring of 2018 while I was hiking the Appalachian Trail near the McAfee Knob in Virginia. I'd been hiking for a week at this point. I live in western North Carolina and was planning on about another two weeks on the AT. I've been on a ton of hikes, but this one was quite terrifying. 
It was mid-May and the scenery was breathtaking. I'd been hiking for about five hours that day when I decided to set up camp near a small brook. I was settling down for the night when I heard this rustling in the bushes nearby. Now, it wasn't the sort of rustling you would dismiss as a rabbit or a squirrel. This was louder and heavier. It sent a shiver down my spine. I remember thinking that maybe somebody else was out there or maybe a deer. I tried not to think about it, but the noise continued and in the exact same spot just off the campsite. It wasn't getting fainter or moving along, so I grabbed my flashlight and I headed towards the noise. As I was getting closer, the rustling stopped, but I could feel something. It's hard to explain, but it was like I could feel eyes on me. This feeling of being watched was overwhelming like I was on display. I showed my flashlight around, but there was nothing to see, just trees and bushes in the blackness beyond my light. It was then that I heard it. I might even go so far as to say I felt it. There was a low growl, deep and guttural. I could feel it vibrate through the ground. I felt a sense of dread like I was definitely in danger. My heart was racing and I was finding it hard to even breathe. My mind was yelling, get out of there, but my body wouldn't listen. Then something happened. This figure slowly emerged from the shadows. It wasn't just any figure. It was enormous and standing on two legs, silhouetted against the sparse moonlight. I felt my heart leap to my throat. I mean, we've all heard the stories right about Sasquatch or Bigfoot or whatever you want to call it. To actually see one, well, that is different. You have to remember that the light wasn't the best. There was no real moon that night, but when my flashlight hit the thing, oh my God, I could see that it was gigantic. I mean, it was really tall. I'd say easily eight or even nine feet. It towered above me, giving off this sense of pure raw power that can completely overwhelm me. It was broad and its shoulders seemed as wide as a small car. No exaggeration. Its arms hung down almost to its knees, rippling with muscle under the hair that was matted and black sort of blending with the shadows. Around its face, well, that's something I will never forget. It was more human-like than ape-like, but still not quite human. Its eyes were large and expressive, shining in the light with an intelligence that startled me. The nose was flat, more like ours than a bear or a wolf. The mouth, when it gaped open, I could see its teeth and even its breath as it exited its mouth in a slow stream of steam. The teeth were large and they looked very sharp. It was a terrifying sight, the kind of thing you would expect to see in a nightmare, not on a peaceful hike in the Appalachian woods. The sound it made was a deep rumbling growl that seemed to shake the very ground beneath me. There was like a primal rawness, a sort of power that you can't really put into words. Then suddenly it let out a roar that echoed through the forest, making the hairs on the back of my neck stand up. Then, just as suddenly, it disappeared from the light of my flashlight. I swung the light slowly back and tried to pinpoint the thing's current location, but I couldn't see anything at all, just that I was alone again, standing there in the pitch black with my heart pounding. That's when I realized that sweat was pouring down from my face and my chest. I hadn't even been aware of what was happening to my body until just then, as you can imagine, I didn't sleep a wink that night. Every noise, every shadow had me on edge. I couldn't wait for the day to break. So just as soon as the sun started peeking over the mountains, I packed up my stuff and I headed onward. There was no real place to go but to continue on the AT. I did cut the hike short. I didn't make those full final two weeks. I just couldn't get over what had happened. I will tell you that since the encounter, I have been back to the Appalachian Trail, but never to that same spot. I can't say I'd ever want to see that section of the trail ever again. My unit and I were stationed at a training base in the Croatian National Forest. We were told that there had been sightings of this creature, and it was very dangerous, so we were on guard for anything really. One night while driving with my navigator, I saw something very large go up in a tree about 100 to 150 yards from the road. My NCOIC also saw this and identified it as a cryptid. I didn't know what that was. I was too busy concentrating on driving in order to avoid hitting whatever it was because it happened so fast. I was convinced it was going to land right in the road, so I have no idea what kind of being it was. What we saw was a large, long, dark furred creature leap from off a dirt road and into the middle of the road. It had been standing next to a tree just outside the wood line that runs parallel to this very desolate stretch of rural highway. It quickly leaps out of view from the road, 
off into the tree line, disappearing for good. At that point, I was just a young soldier at the time. It is the only cryptid sighting of my entire life. It had been a clear night with rain earlier that day, so visibility was good even into the woods that were about 20 to 50 yards from each side of this two-lane road. We stopped and got out to take a look around, but with no flashlight, we had no real idea of what direction to walk. To be honest, I was too freaked out to go into the woods for a closer look myself. We both said that whatever it was must have moved through very quickly and back off into the darkness. We did not hear anything past our own hearts racing. At this point, I've been in the army now for 23 years, and not much faces me anymore. The one thing that will always stick out in my mind was this encounter. I am a believer of UFOs, but when it comes to cryptids such as Bigfoot or whatever it was, if it leaves tracks you can find them, then I'm more than willing to believe it exists. Here's another story. I was at Fort Bragg. It was about 1 a.m. I was sitting on the ground outside waiting for a security checkpoint to clear when I heard something crashing through the trees just over my shoulder towards my right side. If you imagine yourself in that situation, then you have a good example of how I felt. I heard this crashing through the woods sound not more than 20 feet behind me, but there was nothing to be seen other than the trees shaking like crazy. When I turned around and looked, I saw something brown about the size of a small bear covered in fur with black hair all over its face. It kind of had a long tail and pointy ears and no hair on the very top of its face. I would say it was maybe no more than 200 pounds. I began to get very scared and started to pull out my pistol when this thing turned and saw me, ran back into the woods, and was now gone. I felt like it wasn't going to hurt anybody and that I was safe. But if you saw this thing you would understand why I started reaching for my pistol. The whole encounter maybe lasted 5 to 10 seconds at most. The Texas highway stretched out before me, a ribbon of asphalt cutting through the barren landscape. I was on my usual route, hauling a load of logs to a remote rural town. The sun was starting to dip below the horizon, casting long shadows across the road. It was a lonely drive, but I was used to the solitude. It was just me, my trusty old truck, and the open road. As I drove along, the rhythmic hum of the engine and the monotonous scenery started to lull me into a sense of tranquility. I was lost in my thoughts, my mind wandering to everything and nothing all at once. But that peaceful reverie was abruptly shattered when I saw something that sent a jolt of adrenaline through my veins. Up ahead, in the middle of the road, stood a group of figures. My foot instinctively eased off the gas pedal as I squinted to get a better look. At first, I thought they were a pack of wild dogs. But as I drew closer, my blood turned to ice in my veins. These creatures were like no dogs I'd ever seen. They were bipedal, standing on their hind legs like humans. Their bodies were covered in mottled, coarse fur, and their eyes glowed a sinister shade of red. Their snouts were long and black, and their mouths were filled with rows of sharp, gleaming teeth. The most unnerving thing of all was that they seemed to be communicating with each other in a language that was anything but natural. It was guttural and otherworldly, like a symphony of discordant sounds. I honked my horn, hoping to scare them away. But instead of scattering, the pack of creatures dissolved into the shadows and started to converge on my truck. Panic surged through me, and I slammed on the gas pedal, my heart racing as I tried to speed past them. But they were faster than I could have ever imagined. One of them leaped onto the side of my truck, its claws scraping against the metal as it tried to pry open the door. Another slammed its massive body against my window, its red eyes boring into mine. They were relentless, their movements coordinated and calculated. It was as if they were working together with a single purpose to get to me. I felt a surge of primal fear, my instincts taking over as I pushed the truck's accelerator to the floor. The engine roared to life, and the truck surged forward, tires screeching on the pavement. The creatures were still hot on my tail, their inhuman speed allowing them to keep up with my speeding truck. For what felt like an eternity, the pursuit continued. My heart hammered in my chest, and sweat poured down my brow. The howls and growls of the creatures echoed in my ears, drowning out all other sounds. But slowly, I began to gain some distance between us. The wind howled in my ears as I pushed the truck to its limits, praying that I could outrun whatever they were. And then, as suddenly as they had appeared, they stopped. I risked a glance in my rearview mirror and saw the creatures standing on the road, 
watching me with their glowing red eyes. And then, one by one, they began to fade into the darkness, disappearing as if they were never there. Relief flooded through me, and I let out a shaky breath that I hadn't realized I'd been holding. I pulled over to the side of the road, my heart still racing, my hands trembling on the steering wheel. I sat there for a moment, trying to process what had just happened. I knew that I had encountered something beyond explanation that night. Those creatures, whatever they were, were unlike anything I had ever encountered. As I drove the rest of the way to the rural town, the image of those glowing red eyes haunted me. And even though I made it out of that ordeal alive, I couldn't shake the feeling that I had come face to face with something ancient and otherworldly, something that should have never existed in the first place. I was about 16 years old, deer hunting in some very thick and rugged terrain in West Virginia. I was driving through some thickets in a small draw, and you tend to be pretty keyed up when you're doing that because you're trying to be sneaky and silent. But if you flush a deer, you may only have a second or two to see if it's a buck and get a shot off before they disappear into the woods. I heard something moving off to my left, saw a flash of white and gray fur, about the right size, and without even thinking about it, I had my rifle to my shoulder, thumb on the safety, and was trying to find antlers through the sights. It was an old man, had to be in his 70s. This was almost 40 years ago, and I can still see every detail like I'd taken a photo. He was wearing dark green pants, a white shirt, a gray wool sweater, and had a gray felt hat on with a feather in the brim. He had an old pump-action 12-gauge shotgun he was using like a walking stick. I guess he'd never heard of Blaze Orange. In some kind of weird reflex action, I flipped the safety off, sights right dead center on that old man's chest. Then I guess there was a click of recognition, and I flicked the safety right back on. Then I threw my rifle on the ground, sat down and threw up my breakfast and my lunch. I was born in Traverse City, Michigan, and lived there until 1993. It was the fall of 1991 and I had been at a friend's house. I was coming back to my house and as I walked up toward my house, I saw the curtains in my living room window pulled aside and someone look out at me. As I walked through the front door, I came to realize no one was home. I was confused because I had clearly seen the curtain pulled back and a face looked out at me. I looked around the house and started down the hall toward my bedroom. The whole time I was thinking one of my brothers was playing with me and I was expecting them to hop out. My mother's room was at the end of the hall. Near the lower right edge of her door, I saw what I thought was our cat peering around the corner at me. A dark face low to the ground. I called to the cat and then stood frozen as the face rose about four feet. I still get chills from the image in my mind. It wasn't the cat. It was something else. I remember this feeling in my legs that they wouldn't move. They were cemented to the floor like in nightmares. I felt chills run down my spine to my feet, and I bolted through the front door as fast as I could. I ran to the dirt driveway and stood still unsure what to do or where to go. Suddenly, I saw my mom and brothers in our car in the driveway. I had to shake off the feeling that I wasn't alone anymore but also that the daylight was suddenly gone. Somehow it had gone from day to night and I had no memory of it. I don't remember my family pulling into the drive. Some call this missing time. Mine wasn't just missing, it was non-existent. Through the years I have had a recurring dream about this event and it becomes clearer as I get older. I remember my room and my bed. I remember staring out the window at night as I fell asleep and often seeing strange lights. I would mention these to my family and faced constant ridicule for it. This also occurred when I was much younger and my mother would try to explain them as simple tricks of the eyes. Light from cars or something in my peripheral vision seemed brighter than they really were. Many nights during my summer vacations, from the years 1994-1996, I would lay out after our bonfires and look at the stars. 
I had a fascination with counting satellites and seeing shooting stars. There were times I can remember seeing what I thought were satellites and following them in their heading only to see them waver and change direction. I can also recall seeing what I thought were multiple satellites in formation. This all sounds ridiculous, I know, but I'm almost 40 now and this is still with me. I carry it with me like a dark secret. I guess I'm looking for advice on this. I've heard there are therapy options or even hypnosis, although I'm a huge skeptic of hypnosis being used to remember events. Here's a story you can use if you want. When I was in my teens, probably 14 or 15, I remember tossing and turning in my bed in the early morning. I opened my eyes for a split second while turning over like most people do, and I swear to God I saw a small gnome, gremlin-like creature sitting on my shelf watching me, illuminated by the bluish early morning light coming in through the windows. It was about one foot tall, grayish-brown, wearing just a simple tunic on its torso and that's it. It looked a bit like an elf from the Harry Potter movies, but they hadn't been released yet so that image couldn't have been implanted in my brain, as if I was just dreaming this little creature was sitting there. I remember it was sitting with its legs crisscrossed, with its right hand resting on its left knee. It smiled at me, waved very excitedly, and smiled a big toothy grin like he was some long-lost friend happy to see me. Looking back on it, it seemed genuinely nice. I didn't sense any negativity or evil from it at all. I remember seeing it, knowing I was awake, and not thinking anything of it. Upon waking up though, I was creeped out. Did I really see that, or was I just half asleep and still dreaming? In my area of New England near the Bridgewater Triangle, there are stories of Pukwudgies, which are from Native American folklore. Basically small, impish, trickster-type creatures. My father was also an avid collector of Native American artifacts like beads, pottery, and arrowheads, so maybe it was some sort of forest spirit hanging out in my house. This is not a UFO sighting, but something I feel is related and very interesting. After watching a program about a man with something in his body, they extracted it and did not know what it was. I immediately recognized the object and even now, I am getting tingly just writing about it. I was about 16 years old, living in Burnaby, British Columbia, and I was rubbing my calf with my hands as I felt something. I looked closer to find there was something embedded in the right side of my leg below the knee. I tried to get a hold of it with my fingers, but it was too smooth and pointy to get a grip. My mother had a pair of tweezers close by. I propped my leg up on the bathtub. I pinched it with the tweezers and began to pull. I was shocked to see this thing in my leg being so long and pointy, yet I felt no pain. After I pulled it out, there was no blood, but only a hole. I looked at it closely and I can remember it being very similar to a thin yet long and pointy piece of rice. It had a gold, brown color to it and was very hard. I didn't think much of it at the time as I was only 16. The best is yet to come. Frequently, over the next several years, I marveled at the hole. I looked at it, felt it, and didn't go away. For another couple of years, I forgot about it. Then once again, I remembered it. I looked at it and saw another object in the very same hole. I got up and looked for some tweezers. After finally finding some, I pulled it out again. It was identical to the one I pulled out the first time. Again, I was stupid and did not think to save the piece. It has been about 20 years since I pulled the last one out, and still think of it. I still look at it, but it hasn't returned. The only thing I have left is a groan-in hole, that you still can see. I joke about it to the people I tell and even show them the hole. I tell them the people planting this bug on me finally got sick and tired of me removing it. I was staying with a girlfriend of mine while I was in college. 
She lived just north of Solomon's Island in southern Maryland. On a small note, she lived at the top of a ravine in the middle of the woods. She didn't have neighbors for about half a mile in each direction. It was late on a Saturday at the beginning of the summer. I say late, but it was really early, probably about 2.33 a.m. I couldn't sleep, so I decided to go outside and sit on the deck reading and listening to music. It was really nice out, so I figured why not. Her porch, patio was big, and had an outside light that shined about 30 feet to the edge of the woods where it stopped and the night took over. As I sat and enjoyed my book and music, I began to notice something. You know when you have your headphones on and you can still hear the external sound? Well, I kept hearing a rustling. It sounded like leaves rustling, but every time I hit pause and looked, the sound went away. This went on for about five or six more times until I had enough. I knew I heard it. I wasn't crazy, so I paused the music. As soon as I did, I heard the rustling. I shot up and looked at its origin. Still nothing in sight, but the sound remained. I expected to see a squirrel or a rabbit scurrying about, but nothing. And the longer I listened, I realized that it was not the only thing nearby. There were three, all moving in unison just beyond the light's reach. Again, at first, I figured squirrels, rabbits, or maybe even a raccoon given the hour. But the next part is what changed my whole perspective. As I stood there staring into the abyss trying to find the origin of all the mild ruckus, an acorn flew past my head. At first, I thought, oh, it fell, nope. They were being thrown from the darkness. My mind was racing. Oh my God, Bigfoot. That is all that I could think of. So I started picking up the acorns and throwing them back. Trying to escalate the situation, you know, and hoping I can catch a glimpse. After about five minutes, I grew tired of our game and wanted to test the boundaries. I started walking off the porch with a spare golf club in my hand from my girlfriend's brother's set and headed for the woods. Now most people who spend any amount of time in the woods will tell you that there's always sound in the woods. Nothing. Not a freaking sound. It truly was a deafening silence. No crickets, no breeze, no bugs. Zero, zip, nada. The only time this happens is when a predator is nearby. I'm an experienced hunter and I know everything that could be in those woods. Nothing would make it that quiet. A feeling of dread washed over me when all sound left. It was like those moments when time slowed down before an accident. But I pushed on because I'd come this far. No time to chicken out now. I started to move closer to the front of the house, walking up the lane when I was altered to one of the wildest roars I've ever heard. Foxes will make a sound that resembles a woman's scream. This thing was otherworldly. It sounded like a mixture of a human scream coupled with a silverback gorilla roar. Nothing makes that sound. Every hair on my body stood up. I had never in my life heard something so grotesque and inhuman. The worst part was that it was about 30 yards away in the woods. I'm sure it was watching my every move. So, without turning my back to the woods, I slowly crept back to the house, locking the door behind me. I tried to tell my girlfriend, but she thought I was just high. It was real. It happened. I just don't know what it was. I'm Aaliyah, a seasoned hiker with a penchant for exploring the remote wilderness. My latest adventure began with anticipation as I ventured into the heart of this untamed region. Armed with a backpack and hiking gear, I embarked on a multi-day trek through dense forests, steep mountains, and serene lakeshores. The initial days of my journey were as expected demanding hikes, peaceful campfires, and the soothing sounds of nature. It was an adventure that rekindled my connection with the wild, offering freedom and self-discovery. Yet, as days turned into nights, an unsettling shift occurred. On the fourth day, an ominous presence cloaked the once familiar sounds of the wilderness. Birds fell silent, and the forest felt foreboding. Strange signs emerged trees marked by claw-like scars and animal remains stripped to the bone. I realized I was no longer the apex predator. 
I had become prey. Fear gripped me, but my determination to find an exit pushed me forward. The sensation of being watched grew stronger, and guttural growls haunted the eerie silence. My flashlight and knife offered fragile comfort. Finally, I reached a cliff's summit, glimpsing the lurking predator below an elusive and formidable presence. With nowhere to go, it retreated into the wilderness. Exhausted yet resolute, I continued, returning to civilization with a story of survival a testament to the unbreakable spirit of a solitary hiker in the Pacific Northwest's wilderness. Back in 1957, my mother, father, and little sister who was six were picnicking near Rouse's Point, New York on the shore of Lake Champlain. At one point, my sister walked to the end of a dock and looked into the water. She turned to leave and heard a noise behind her. She turned and saw two black webbed hands appear at the end of the dock. Then suddenly a child-sized head appeared. At this point, she screamed and ran back to us and told us what she saw. Her scream had already alarmed us, and we were running towards her to see what was wrong. After she told us what happened, my father told us to stay here and went to inspect the dock where he found two web-like handprints at its end. Well, the picnic was over. Many times I heard my father relate this story to friends and relatives. Sometimes they would nod their heads and recount their odd stories of the lake. Two more things. Years later, when my sister saw the old movie The Creature from the Black Lagoon, she swears that it was similar to the creature she saw that day. When my father, who liked to fish on the lake, passed away, I was going through his belongings to find, at the bottom of his tackle box, a loaded 45 caliber pistol. Odd for a tackle box, but I guess he thought better safe than sorry. I'm 70 and it makes no difference to me if you believe this story or not. I'm just relating what happened years ago while on a picnic. I recently had an interesting encounter in the forest with my girlfriend. We go to this place as a gathering spot to heal, to learn. I've always had a relationship with Bankhead National Forest in Alabama. From the first time I visited the place, I felt the profound spiritual essence of the forest. I have often been able to bond with the forest creatures there. On the most recent trip, we went with no dogs and were not that well prepared. By the time we were ready to leave the back falls, it was already getting dark. We had to really hustle to get out of the forest and back up to the trailhead leading back to the car. At one point, all our lights went out and phones died. It's at this critical point on the trail where we have to take a side trail off the marked trail to get back up to the car. Luckily, we spot the exit and make our way back up hills towards the car. Right as we make it out of the forest and can see the last bit of sunlight through the low branches to guide us out. And in this final moment of the trip, a noise I can't quite place, nor accurately describe reverberated through the forest. What sounded like an Asgard plasma beam dropping through the canopy of the forest, trees crashing and limbs breaking. And then we heard the creature itself let out something like a large animal's snort combined with a demon's laugh. Never heard anything like this at Bankhead. My first thought was Skinwalker. We both felt like we were being watched for a time down by the water. I don't know about you guys, but when I think of fairies, I'm picturing something like Tinkerbell. Yeah, I know, she's technically a pixie, sue me. That is not the shit my roommate is messing with. I noticed she was weird when I moved in. She was advertising for a roommate on Craigslist, and she said she'd need someone who was open-minded, who was all right with strange people coming and going at all hours, who wouldn't ask questions about things that didn't involve them and who would be okay with sharing a bathroom. Yeah, okay, not ideal. But I didn't need ideal, I needed livable. And honestly, I didn't really give a shit what she did in her spare time. Hell, she could have been cooking meth in her room, as long as she didn't get me involved in her drug deals, 
I wouldn't have given a shit. Turns out she wasn't dealing drugs. Unless she was sharing marijuana with her deadbeat friends or something. Instead, she was into the occult. Supernatural stuff. Conspiracy theories. She believes in anything and everything. She's convinced she's seen Bigfoot. She was abducted by aliens when she was 10 years old. She doesn't get vaccines because the government is using them to control people's minds. That kind of stuff. Is it terrible for me to say that I kind of like her? I mean, let's make no mistake here. She's messed in the head. But she's actually a really good roommate. Pays her bills on time. Cleans up after herself. Asks me before having her weird gatherings and rituals and shit. Whenever she buys groceries, she grabs my favorite candy bar for me. And at least she's interesting. I'd rather sit and talk to her for an hour than listen to Nancy from work describe her latest MLM adventures. And before you argue with me, Stella, that's the name my roommate chose for herself, I guess doesn't vote. So it's not like her weird-ass opinions and beliefs hurt anyone else. She told me once she thinks that if you enter a voting booth, the government will put you to sleep, embed your skin with a mind-reading chip, and release you back into society, and you won't have any memory of what happened. And that it happened to her mom, and that's why her mom believes in evolution. Right? Anyway, so life with Stella wasn't terrible. We got along okay for the most part. And we managed to live together for six months before her weirdness started getting a little too close for comfort. What do I mean by that? Well, one morning I woke up to mold growing in a ring in our living room. Seriously, it was a huge ass ring. Our living room is actually pretty sizable, especially since Stella doesn't believe in furniture, so it's practically empty except for her weird candles everywhere. It never bothered me, since I don't use the common spaces much anyway. But mold growing in my apartment was definitely not okay. Stella, what the hell is this? I asked. Stella was sitting at the edge of it, a mountain of books next to her. I saw a few titles straight away. Myths of the Fey folk, fairies and other creatures, the magical arts. In her hands was a book on botany, which was extremely peculiar in the moment but not so much in hindsight. It's a fairy ring. At least, it will be, she said, a small frown on her petite lips as she poured over her book. I bit back the urge to scream. I don't know what a fairy ring is, but I'm pretty sure it doesn't belong in our living room. If you don't get it out of here, so help me God. Stella sighed and put her book down. I thought you'd say that, she said reaching into the black messenger backpack at her side and pulling out a slightly crumpled envelope. She always had that bag on her, and I often saw her pull out any number of weird things from it. So you can understand that I was a little hesitant to take the envelope from her. But I did, and I opened it, and immediately my frayed nerves were soothed. Five hundred dollars in cash will do that to a person. For the inconvenience, she said, going back to her book without a second glance at me. And if we get in trouble with the landlord, I'll pay for any damages. I knew our landlord wouldn't bother coming around and checking he didn't give a shit what anyone did in those apartments. Anyway, so I was more than happy to let it slide. As long as that shit didn't start growing in my room. I did wonder where she got all that money, though. Stella was never short on cash, even though she didn't have a job. At least not that I could tell. Oh, well, never look a gift horse in the mouth. I shrugged my shoulders and let it go. That night before I went to bed, I googled fairy rings. I only read for about five minutes before I got bored and gave up on it. Do you know how much has been written about these things? Too much. Anyway, I figured out two very important things. First, many cultures believe that fairy rings are caused by fairies or pixies dancing in a circle. Second, mortals absolutely should not F with them. Now, I wasn't worried. Not only did I not believe in fairies, but I was also pretty sure you couldn't just grow your own fairy ring. I figured that Stella would lose interest in it after a few weeks, like she always did with her random obsessions, and then she'd get rid of it and life would continue as normal. Before that had a chance to happen, however, the fairy ring grew. 
After a few days, it had sprouted mushrooms. I shit you not, literal mushrooms were growing in my living room. Stella seemed overjoyed with this arrangement. I was pretty grossed out because our room was starting to smell. Damp and musty and just gross. I really wanted to yank up that carpet and scrub all that nasty crap away. But I focused on the $500 I was getting for being cooperative and tried to will away my annoyance. Stella's excitement grew over the next few days until it spilled over into the few conversations we had. It's almost ready. They'll be here soon. I can feel it, she said one night when we were having a beer. She was sitting in the middle of the circle while I stayed far outside it. Not out of superstition, but because I wasn't going near that nasty thing. Are you sure that's how it works? I asked. My skepticism must have been obvious, because her response was just on this side of indignant. I've done my research, Janice. It's like that movie. What was it? If you build it, they will come. Just like that. I've made the ring. They won't be able to resist dancing on it. That's just how it works. I wasn't convinced, but... Aw, oh, hell, why not? It's not real anyway, so who cares how she thinks it works? So, what happens afterwards? She looked confused. After what? After the fairies show up, I said. What happens? Do you... Talk to them? Trap them? Ask them to grant you a wish? What? She stared at me in utter bewilderment for a second, and then burst out laughing. God, Janice, you're so funny sometimes, she said. I chose not to press the point. Instead, I finished my beer and went to bed. Things played out about how I expected over the next week or so. Stella was obsessed with her fairy ring. I cycled between ignoring it and indulging her. Eventually, her interest started to wane, and she began to turn her attention to other things. I noticed a few books on the Jersey Devil appearing around the apartment. So I figured that's what would plague my life next. I felt like I was living in some sort of sitcom. And then, three weeks ago, something different happened. I woke up around four in the morning, my sleep disturbed by a strange blue glow coming from under my door. I stumbled out of bed, rubbing the sleep from my eyes as I went in search of the light source. As soon as I entered the living room, I was almost blinded by the blue light assaulting my eyes. I swore to myself as I shielded my face, trying to let my eyes adjust. Eventually they did and I was able to take in the terrible sight that awaited me. Stella, naked, dancing on the fairy ring. Her body twisted and jerked, almost like she was being pulled along. She stumbled but didn't fall, going round and round so quickly it made me dizzy. I started to walk towards her, confused and somewhat unsettled. Was she on acid or something? I almost just went back to my room and pretended I hadn't seen anything. But then the blood caught my attention. It oozed from small cuts all over her body. A ring of blood was crusted around her wrists. Slashes across her abdomen resulted in red rivulets tracing paths down her legs. Finally, I saw her face. Her eyes were fixed on me, and a shudder worked its way down my spine. Her face was twisted in agony, her mouth a grimace, her eyes red with tears. Snot was running out of her nose. She was heaving for breath, and I was sure, so sure I saw her scream. Except, there was no sound. Nothing at all. I couldn't hear the sound of cars passing by on the road outside, the sound of her feet on the carpet, the sound of her breathing. It was like I was trapped in a vacuum. But then again, I didn't really need to hear what she was screaming. I could read it on her lips like the words had been printed there. Help me, help me, help me, help me. My body responded to her silent plea, and I lunged at her, hand outstretched, intent on wrenching her from the circle. But just then, she disappeared, vanished in front of my eyes as though she'd never been there. I tripped and fell to my knees, just outside the ring of glowing blue mushrooms that dotted the floor. Slowly, before my eyes, the glow faded to nothing until I was alone in the dark. Just me, the silence, and the knowledge that Stella was not coming back. I called the police, of course. That's what you do, right? 
I've never been in a situation quite like that before. I knew I couldn't tell them what I saw, so I just told them that when I woke up, she was gone, and that was rare for her. That I was worried something had happened. They declared her missing. I steered clear of the living room. I wanted to get out of there as fast as humanly possible, so I booked a hotel room until I managed to find another place. I didn't give a shit about breaking the lease or forfeiting the security deposit on the apartment. I just wanted out. I got a place pretty quickly, a real dump of a studio apartment. But it's affordable and built up my courage to go back to our apartment, to pack up my few things and go. When I opened the door, God, no matter how long I live, I'll never forget this. When I opened the door, she was there, lying there in the middle of the fairy ring. The cuts had deepened into permanent grooves in her body. She was thinner than before, as though someone had sucked the flesh out of her, tightened her skin until it was tough and leathery. In fact, she almost looked like she'd been mummified. Her eyes were gone. Her teeth were gone. Her mouth was still gaping open, still screaming for someone me to help her. And as I stared at the body, I swear to God I heard a faint giggle coming from somewhere in the apartment. I think I'm done with roommates for a while. I've only hiked at night once intentionally. I was camping in the very southern tip of Illinois with a, with a big group of people ten or so. It was a privately owned park, so we weren't allowed to leave out plots past 10 p.m., but we all wanted to go stargazing at the lake. We waited till probably around midnight and left for the lake. If you've never experienced nighttime away from civilization, let me tell you, it gets dark. We all held hands and walked in a line because you quite literally couldn't see your hand in front of your face. We didn't use flashlights because we didn't want rangers to see us leaving camp so late. As we got closer to the lake, we heard a non-animal make a trilling hooting sound. Imagine a baritone owl hooting into a fan. That's the best I can do to describe it, haha. -ha. It was kind of creepy sounding, but we all just assumed it was a weird owl doing his thing. We were now in the tree line at the lake, and the trilling had gotten louder and more aggressive sounding. We were all on edge and starting to think that maybe it wasn't an owl. Some of my friends laid down to look at the stars, but I was too freaked out to relax. The trilling got much closer and dirt and leaves were being thrown towards us from the tree line. Obviously not an owl at this point. We all decide to leave immediately. I'm shaking in fight or flight mode, but unable to run because we all have to hold hands or someone might get lost. We decide to take a shortcut straight through the ranger station because it seemed safer than taking the trail back, also because it's lit up. The trilling follows us for a bit, but stops once we pass the ranger station. I was never more relieved to get back to camp. Still no idea what kind of cryptid it was, though. I googled online and still wonder if it could be a mothman. When I was really young, like six maybe, I woke up one morning and found a huge scar on the top of my foot. It looked like an old scar, but I had never seen it before. I showed my parents and tried explaining that this is new and was never there before, but they weren't interested. I played with it all day, utterly confused and nervous. Next morning, it was gone. My foot was back to normal. Later that say, I dropped a coffee cup and a piece of it sliced, the top of my foot open, right where the scar had been. And sure enough, it left the exact same scar I had seen the day before. I had been cooking breakfast in my in-law's guest house with my dog when he suddenly started barking at something in the corner of the room. Nothing was there. He started backing up as if whatever he was barking at was coming closer to him. He was using his deep intimidation bark, which I had only heard a few times before. Tail tucked, totally freaked out. Knowing the house was originally built by the first owner who died many years ago, 
Everyone jokes about it being haunted. A friend claims he saw shadows during in the months he lived in there, and sometimes we hear footsteps while in the garage below. This is when I decided it was time to go. Friendly ghost or not, I was not about to stick around. My dog sprinted out of there as fast as he could checking behind him on the way out. An hour later, I am exhausted and napping in the main house. I'm not sure how I began to lucid dream as I have not really done it much in the past. At some point in my dream, I decided to go back into the guest house. As clear as day, I hear a man talking about the house. Just a normal conversation, almost like he was showing me around the house. I then get this feeling like something is lurking behind me. As I turn, I see this black, hunched figure, and at this point I am freaked out. It jumps over the banister to the stairs and I can hear the loud, heavy stomps down the stairs. I even felt the vibrations. It was so real. Needless to say, I did not go back into that place for a few days. Nothing like that has happened since, but I was really shaken up. Can't explain it. I was 21 and really into primitive camping in 2015. I had taken a long trip to Daniel Boone National Forest in Kentucky in the spring. I had my borer collie with me, who loved the forest. We had been there more than 10 times for overnight trips at this point. After finding our normal place, we set out and hiked 10 miles, and we had ran into a handful of people on the trail. We camped overnight. When we woke up, had breakfast, got packed up and headed out. It was about noon. About an hour into our walk the second day, every sound stopped. And when I say sound stopped, I mean things were absolutely dead quiet. It was terrifying. I couldn't hear the wind. I couldn't hear water trickling by the stream. No birds. Nothing. My ears rang terribly because of the silence. I can't emphasize how terrified I was. I had never experienced anything like this. And then, my border collie growled. I could hear the growl. It sounded so strange in the quiet. And at that point, I knew that it wasn't just my ears. I talked to my dog and tried to calm her down, and I could hear my voice. When I took a step, I would hear the step. It wasn't just me. It wasn't my ears. My dog was reacting, too. After about 45 seconds, things returned to normal. Completely normal. The wind was there. We could hear birds. The stream. Everything. Completely normal. My dog and I hiked out and left immediately. I'm an avid hiker now and constantly out on trails. Nothing close to this has ever happened again. I swear to God I still have nightmares. I've never been back to that forest. My boyfriend and I are currently remodeling our house, so we're living in the old garage that we've converted into a living space while the rest of the house is gutted. The door that leads to the rest of the house is right next to bed, and I always lock it every night because, you know, it's scary out there. Well, one night it was around two in the morning, and we had a knock on the door. We both heard it, and it woke us both up. This would mean someone was inside our house essentially knocking on our bedroom door. However, when we finally got the courage to get up and look all the doors and windows were locked, and there was no way anyone could have gotten in or out. So I still don't know who or what knocked on our door. There is a sloped field behind my house with forest at the top and forest at the bottom. When I was little, one morning around 8 a.m., I saw a child sprint out of the forest and run down the hill as fast as he could. It struck me as odd because I don't have any close neighbors. He was wearing jeans and a red jacket, and the kid was probably around 10 years old. I told my parents, and they didn't believe me, but I knew what I saw. A few years later, my dad came to me and told me he saw the same thing. A kid in jeans and a red jacket sprinting down the hill from the forest.
I was with my parents at a small bar near my home, and there was a man that could not speak, but he used his hands to communicate with me. I remember talking to him, and then he gave me a flower, although I could not hear him, I could clearly understand what he wanted to say. After a while my parents said we are leaving so I left the old man alone. In car my mom said didn't you get bored? No I was talking with a person all the time. He could not speak, but I could understand him, and then my mom went what person? I didn't see a person with you at all. My husband used to play hockey and his games were usually late. He would come home around midnight. On one of those nights, my son and I were in bed when I heard my husband's truck pull in. He dropped his keys outside of the door. He came inside the house and slammed the door so hard. The wall shook so, not like him. I looked out the window to make sure it really was him and his truck wasn't there. I walked out of the bedroom and I see my son standing in front of his door with a baseball bat. He whispered, it's not dad. As we stood there frozen in fear, the TV came on full blast. I called 911 and was told that help was on its way. Finally, we see flashlights through the downstairs window and see two police officers walking the perimeter of the house. They knock on the door and I let them in and the first thing they ask is, why is the TV on so loud? I tell them the story and they check every inch of the house, all the doors deadbolts, and windows are locked so they tell us there's no way this could have happened. They start looking at us like we made it up. I called my husband to come home since the officers had to leave my son begged them to stay. As soon as they left, the dining room chandelier started flickering and the lights turned off. We just sat there in fear until my husband got home. When we told my husband what happened, he immediately said, I guess if I turn the TV on, the volume will be all the way up. Yes, I turned the TV off instead of turning down the volume. I turned the TV on. The volume was almost all the way down. To this day, I have no idea what happened that night. But I know something was in our house. So this was about two years ago in my garden at about 3 a.m. I just got a puppy and he'd wake me up to go outside at silly hours of the morning. Anyway, I heard a couple days before from one of the neighbors that someone was standing on her shed roof just laughing at her and her family while they were watching TV. They called the police, but he was gone as soon as he heard the sirens. Apparently someone else around the corner reported the same thing a week before but he apparently had some sort of shiv, but the police didn't find him. Back to my part in this. So my lovely little pupper was running around the garden, and I was just standing there looking around, and I saw him standing on someone else's shed. I grabbed my pup and ran in the house. I think I threw an orange at him to try and scare him off, but he didn't even budge. I was about to call the police when I heard a screech and saw loads of police running down the alleyway by my house. I turned to look at the guy, but he was gone. The police called for a helicopter and everything. He was never found, but stopped doing it. I personally suspected as being the Croydon London, UK cat killer as both people had cats, but who knows. Generally feeling shaken up remembering it all as I'm writing this. My friend once showed up in a panic at my old house, where I lived with my now ex. She was really worried asking if we were all right and what happened. We couldn't figure out what she meant. We'd just been at home that day. She showed us her phone. On her calls were three missed calls and a voicemail from my phone number an hour before. The voicemail was mostly garbled shouting and crying, but it definitely sounded like my voice. Then my ex telling me to calm down, then me crying again. My phone had no record of the calls or the voicemail. We hadn't argued or yelled. I hadn't cried. We still don't know what happened, but it was weird as heck.
I took a solo backpacking trip to Japan in 2018. During the first week of the trip, a group of travelers and myself decided to go and drink at one of the local karaoke bars. After approximately two hours of constant drinking and singing, we all left the place fairly drunk. We were all on the street when myself and a girl from the group decided that we needed to go to the toilet. We left the group that was congregating on the sidewalk and entered a building a block or two away. We caught an elevator up a few floors and exited. As we were walking down these red felt corridors, we approached the entry of what seemed to be an old school Japanese gentleman's club. The tipsy Danish girl whom I was with walked straight on into the place, and I instantly got tingles in the back of my neck. Every single Japanese man there was looking at her as she strolled on up to the bar. I felt something was off and grabbed her wrist and swiftly pulled her out. We jogged out of that place and came to a set of fire stairs. We started to briskly walk down them while talking about that weird encounter. This is where it gets done. During our rush downstairs we went one floor lower than we should have and ended up in the basement. As I rounded the corner I saw a man dressed in a SWAT uniform couching with his gun drawn his back to us in the room I could count about three four dead Japanese men riddled with bullet holes leaning up against pillars and on the floor. I grabbed my Danish friend and noped the F out of that place. Still to this day I don't know what the F I saw. Was it a snuff? Was it roleplay? I don't know. I was very drunk, but I also know what I saw. Around when I was in middle school, I went to a friend's house to hang out, and their mother pulled out a Ouija board. This particular one was marketed towards speaking with angels for us to use for fun. There were about five or six of us using it and asking it various questions, and when it was my turn, I chose to see if I could speak with my father who had passed some years prior. I decided to ask questions that no one else in the room could possibly know, and the board gave the correct answer every time. I'm not religious in the slightest and have a more than healthy level of skepticism, and the same could be said when I was that age as well. So I decided to remove my hand from the board because I knew it was possible that I could be subconsciously moving it to the right place. I keep asking it a couple more questions and it keeps giving the correct answer. So I'm pretty freaked out at this point and choose to try to rationalize what happened in my head. The next kid starts asking questions about one of his dead relatives and it tells him a detail about their death that he didn't know but sounded pretty plausible. At least he seemed to think so as he locked himself into a bedroom after that in hysterics. I don't know what happened in that house to this day, but it was the closest I've ever come to what I would call a supernatural experience. To start out, my name is Doug, and my father and I are what you would call avid hunters, and we know what is in the woods where we hunt. Well, we took a trip to West Virginia to go black bear hunting. I was back at camp, resting from an early morning bear hunt, and my father went out to go hunting for the afternoon. I knew where he would be in case of an emergency. Well, he gets to his spot and stays there until the sun sets, and then he starts to head back to the side by side he took out to get to his spot. On his way back, he heard footsteps, and remember, this is in the mountains where only hunters and rare locals know where they're at. The footsteps he heard were nothing human or bare. He stopped for a second and kept walking, and then the most blood-curdling yet powerful yell came from behind him. He thought, so this is how it ends. Well, it'll be a hell of a race if he gets to the side by side. As soon as he got in, something came running up at him and threw a giant rock at him. My father came back to the camper. I was waiting for him, and that was the first time I ever saw my father scared. He didn't come out of the camper until it was time to leave, and we left with no further incident whenever we returned. My name is Jonathan and I've been a ranger for 12 years now. 
I've always loved working in the forest. You see, it's very quiet, peaceful, and it feels like it's the only career path where you can really be one with nature. But I've experienced some paranormal things here and there, ranging from unexplained to downright terrifying. I'm gonna start this story off with what happened. I won't mention the name of the town, but I'll say that it's very old, and the only people that live out there are those who either used to live out there or people who enjoy living away from civilization completely. The majority of its population is elderly, which means when we get a call in the middle of the night, it usually means that somebody has passed away. This time was different, however, because it was not an elderly person who had died. It was two hikers, two college students to be exact. They were trekking through the woods when they stumbled upon a large tree that had managed to fall over them, but it was wedged between several other trees. Now, even though we wrote it down as the tree fell on them, I'm going to tell you what really happened. The witness that I interviewed said she had watched them go up about 10 feet before turning around to head back to town. That's when she saw this massive canine leap out of nowhere, attacking both of them. It dragged one of the girls off, but ripped the other girl right in half, spilling out her innards on the tree below. When my partner and I went out there together, we found their bodies less than 100 feet away from each other, which is why we had to write this down as a tree fell on them. It just makes the paperwork easier. Now, no trace of this creature or canine was ever found. Their bodies and faces were so mangled, recognition was nearly impossible. We had to use dental records to do it. This was also very close to town and in view of a lot of the community, which is why we had several witnesses. Personally, I have no idea what could have done this or why it happened, but I know one thing's for sure. Seeing a young woman like that ripped apart by something like, I don't know, a werewolf really does a number on you. Anyway, I hope this story was enough to convince you that the woods aren't always exactly safe. Take it from a guy like me who works in this job field. I see it and experience it a lot more than we're allowed to talk about. Hi, first a bit about me. I served in the Navy for 20 years as a military police officer. I am now retired after many years in the security industry. The following incident happened to me about five weeks ago while on holiday at my mom's farm, which is situated in southern Scotland. It was around 5 p.m. and the sun had just set. It was getting dark quite quickly. I was walking up to my vehicle parked at the side of her house, where she lives with her partner, when my attention was drawn towards one of my mom's fields by some odd appearing lights which were kind of hovering above in the sky. These lights were glowing bright white, but they appeared to be descending slowly, almost as if they were dropping down into the field. As I got closer, the lights became apparent that there were actually now two white lights, both of which were the same size, but now one was beginning to get larger than the other. I crept closer, getting about 50 yards within these lights, and the large white light began to move towards me at a slow pace and then almost hovering above me before disappearing. It appeared to be at least as big as a house, maybe bigger if anything. There were no visible features on this object whatsoever, just two bright white lights which appeared to be projecting downwards. The smaller medium-sized light remained in the field below it for another few minutes until it too headed off in the distance where I lost sight of it completely. The larger light then re-emerged before disappearing again back into thin air after leaving this tiny blur trace behind it. The only thing that's strange that I've dealt with while on Scottish soil. When I was younger, I also dealt with something of a beast in the Scottish woods. The incident happened when I was out walking in the woods with my family. We were all enjoying our walk when it started to get dark, so we turned around and headed back towards home. It wasn't long before I noticed something following us, but at first I didn't think too much of it, being naive about such phenomena. But then, this thing began to run through the trees, keeping pace beside me alongside my family. Knowing that something was wrong, 
I quickly shouted for everybody to run ahead while trying not to lose sight of them at the same time. The creature moved faster, though, despite its size, even faster than myself, which is surprising due to the amount of times I've served in combat zones abroad where adrenaline can be flowing through your body constantly. No matter how fast I ran, I could never gain ground on it. And what's more is that the deeper we went into the woods, this thing just seemed to be getting bigger too. When we reached a clearing, I quickly hid behind some shrubs, trying not to let this beast see me as my family escaped. It continued to grow in size until there was no mistaking its identity. It looked like a mutated bear carved out of stone almost, with large ears which were almost elven in shape and a much more elongated head. The two horns protruding from its forehead and nine eyes like some freakish arachnid, it was terrifying. I also spotted another smaller creature looking around as well. It wasn't as big, but it looked just as striking, not as sound. Either of these things made this was one of the most unnerving things of all. The creatures saw one another and headed off into the distance, I think still looking for me and the family, although I'm not too sure. To this day, I cannot explain what these things were, only that they were definitely not from this world, far more terrifying than anything that I've ever seen while serving. I will say that if it wasn't for my training, I probably wouldn't be alive today. Although I am currently homeless, I am not without a job. I decided to leave the army after three years of service due to pretty terrible pay and long uncompensated hours at work. After a few months of job searching, I was able to line a pretty great job as a fraud investigator in Kansas City. The pay was excellent, and the only thing that would keep anyone from accepting this job was the commute distance of a thousand miles from Fort Bragg, NC. An additional obstacle would be that once I did get there, I wouldn't have the funds to rent an apartment. Essentially, I would be homeless for two weeks until I got my first paycheck. For many people, this would be a deal breaker, and I can see why, but being in the army for so long, I got used to eating shit sandwiches for breakfast and making almost any situation work for me. We used to go to the field for weeks at a time, and that would involve camping in the woods and in most cases not having showers until we left for home. Since this wasn't a new situation for me, I had accepted the job offer and made my way over to Kansas City as soon as I was released from my duties from the Army ETS. I liked to drive so I was able to make that trip in just two days. Once I got to my new city, I got to searching for areas the locals or police wouldn't mind someone camping for an extended amount of time. By nightfall, I was able to find a natural area, a patch of gravel next to the road, only a few feet from the woods, where camping up to two weeks was free, and no one would bother me until I had the funds to move into my own apartment. I had brought some supplies in preparation for this. Extra clean clothes, canned food, sheets, and wet towels I could use to shower in the mornings. Since I didn't have a camping tent, I decided to convert the back of my car into a bed. After placing the back seats down, I actually had enough space to comfortably sleep in, so I placed some sheets down and decided to tie another sheet above me so no one could peek in through my windows and see me sleeping there. For a few days, this worked just fine. But as I was driving back to my campsite one night, I started to notice some weird things. When I was working on my bed setup, I noticed that the forest went dead quiet. Usually crickets and other animal noises would rule the night air, but it was completely silent that night. The moment I noticed I felt completely uneasy and felt like I was being watched. I hurried with what I was doing and jumped in my secure car. A couple of minutes passed until I was able to ignore that overwhelming feeling of dread and browse some YouTube videos. Eventually, I forgot about the situation and fell asleep. A couple of hours into the night, I got up as I usually do and noticed that the window closest to my face was foggy as someone had been breathing on the other side. I was disoriented and grabbed my phone to check what time it was. I paused for a moment. There was a sound coming from the other side of the makeshift bed. 
the other window that was covered by the sheet that was only a few inches above me. The sound was light, gentle tapping on the glass. I doubt if I wasn't already awake, I would have heard it. The fear took a few moments to register, and it took me a few more moments to think through if I really wanted to investigate further. Eventually, my morbid curiosity won over, and I quietly and gently reached for the sheet, pulling it up ever so slightly. What I saw made me choke. On the other side of the window, there was some creature. Big, hairy, and crouching over to my window. Before you ask, no, it wasn't Bigfoot. It had hair on what I could see of its body, but it was thinning and patchy. It was big, but not muscle-bound. It was very skinny and had long claws on its bony hands. It was tapping on the window with them. The most grotesque of its features was that horrible smile. Its smile was ear to ear. I don't know if it was because it was enjoying this, or if it saw me when I took a quick peek at it. I tried not react as if I tried to make it to my front seat to drive away. It could easily break through the window with those sharp claws and get to me. So for the next couple of hours, I just laid in my makeshift bed, praying that the thing outside my window didn't break in and kill me. Eventually, the tapping stopped and the sun came up. I got out of my car the next morning and investigated the area around my car. There were weird tracks all over my campsite that only confirmed I hadn't imagined the whole thing, and there really was something on the other side of my window. Why it didn't just break into my car and do whatever it wanted to do is only one of the questions nagging at me. The other would be how long had that thing actually been coming to my campsite at night, and had it been the first time it came so close to me, or had this just been the first time I had caught it? Either way, I found a new campsite tonight far away from where I had my encounter with that creature. I think I'll need to move again in the morning if I make it that long because as I'm typing this, I can hear something tapping at my window. My name is Rec, but you can call me Terrace. That was, after all, my nickname in Iraq. I had a few buddies who called me that. I guess it's like some kind of slang war as hell. But over there, they play by different set rules. Anyway, I was in the military for about eight years, and since then, I have worked as some kind of private contractor for the last five. I don't know if I should be telling you this story, but anyway, even if your website is anonymous, you never know how safe things are nowadays with all the cybercrime and cyber terrorism going on. It didn't take long after getting off duty to head out towards home, which is just outside of town near this farm that my parents used to own long before they passed. It's not much, just a little place where I store food now and keep my own personal things. But in a way, it is home to me. Feels good to get out of the country after being in that desert for so long. It was already dark when I got off the road about 10 miles from home. Maybe thanks to all those darn clouds blocking out any of that beautiful moonlight. So, I figured with the darkness setting in very fast, no sense in wasting time. I got out my magnum flashlight and continued on foot across the bumpy gravel path towards the farm buildings ahead of me, which were now barely visible in this thick black darkness. I made my way past some trees and overgrown vegetation, lighting the road, until I came upon an old pathway that leads to the backside of my parents' old farmhouse. Earlier in the day, I couldn't help but notice that this pathway looked like it had been trampled over by something large. So, I decided to come out here and investigate what was going on. It didn't take long to see why these large tracks were being made across this part of the farmland. The grass was already flattened down by something very heavy walking back and forth through here multiple times. Just short of the summer season, it wasn't hard for me to figure out whatever caused these prints in the ground was probably pretty big. Easily nine or ten feet tall, if not more, given how wide apart each set of footprints were from each other. So, I came upon a small clearing and stopped, shining my flashlight just ahead of me. And I heard an awful sound that still haunts me to this day, a blood-curdling howl followed by a hissing, crackling, and rumbling. Immediately, the hairs on the back of my arms stood up in fear. I've done some bad things in Iraq, 
but nothing like what was going on right in front of me. At first sight, my flashlight beam only lit a part of it before its eyes. It was large and black looking before standing fully upright. Its wide shoulders and massive chest were, from what I could tell, covered in a reddish brown fur. It was hunched over as it looked, the tall grass partially hiding it. At first, I assumed maybe it was some kind of bear, but as my light hit its eyes, they glowed this bright orange amber. It was like two hot glowing coals bathed in crimson anger. Short for a Bigfoot, but no more than six feet tall if I had to guess. All that muscle definition everywhere you looked on its body. What kind of species this thing belonged to eluded me. Other than knowing whatever it actually was, it wasn't human friendly. I stood there frozen with tears, staring right back at this creature whose size alone would have easily outweighed me by over 100 pounds, if not more. The jaws on this thing were large and black, opening up so wide I could now see down its throat. As I let out this other unholy howl that made the ground shake underneath our feet, this must be what a deer feels like when looking into an approaching freight train that's about to run it over. The only thing we had between us was an open field and darkness surrounding us both during this tense moment of fear and trepidation. The creature wasn't moving towards me at first. For some reason, I knew that engaging with it would have resulted in a death sentence. So, simply, I retracted after the initial shock wore off. I slowly backed away from this thing while keeping my light pointing right at it. It continued to stand there, seeming to be just as afraid of me as I was, or at least it acted that way. Why did it come into the clearing in the first place? We kind of just stood there, having a face-off, what felt like an eternity before I made a mistake that probably would have sealed my fate. In order to back away from this thing, who did not advance towards me, but rather stayed where it was, I had no choice but to turn around and run back across the field. Now, I want to say this because it's important never, and I mean never, do you turn your back and run from a large predator, especially one like this that's unknown. You just don't do it. It entices them to chase you. That's exactly what happened, and I was not even armed when this happened, either. I was about halfway across the clearing when I heard it coming after me, before jumping down and disappearing into the brush, just mere feet away from me. I don't care if you don't believe, you don't have to. I'm telling you the terror of that night is real, and what I endured is real. I had more than enough time to take a good look at this creature, and I would most certainly remember what it looked like. I will never forget that face as long as I live with those eyes staring into my very soul with pure hatred, is forever embedded into my memory. I have no idea how fast this thing could have chased me down, but I know it would have made a meal out of me if given the chance. As soon as I cleared the trees and got back from around my house, I ran inside, locked every door and window before going up to my bedroom, which was on the second floor of the house with a balcony outside facing where I had just come from. I didn't sleep the entire evening, but the following morning, I actually insisted on staying at a hotel for the time being. Too many strange things were going on around the property, and I wasn't going to take any chances of being mauled to death by some monster. The next day, after what just happened, I finished paying up at the hotel, which had its own little restaurant connected to it, providing pretty good food. So, the front desk person wanted to talk to me about what happened last night. After I kind of gave him a little bit of info on me and what I went through, they told me something very interesting about my ordeal that made me feel more uneasy all over again. He said the hunters who use the fields behind the house and around have seen these large black dogs out there, the largest wolves they've ever seen before, but only during deer hunts which is the only time of the year that deer are in the area. Can you believe that? I never knew there were wolves here, but the more I thought about it, the more sense it made. These are large, unknown canids, and I don't want anything to do with it. I will describe exactly what happened before, during the, and after my involvement in the incident that transpired in January of 2018. 
It all started from my unit on January's overseas deployment three weeks earlier, and we're enjoying some much-deserved R&R when the call came we were to immediately regroup at our primary operations base for an emergency action. We all assumed some vital intel had come in concerning an HVT high-value target somewhere in a foreign theater. Looking back now, I wish that was the case. Unfortunately, it wasn't. We were given a brief summary of the situation, and we were told we would be given all the particulars once we reached our FOB forward operating base, which turned out to be the Sierra Nevada Mountains. We grabbed our gear, boarded a plane, and departed immediately. None of us knew exactly what kind of situation we were being dropped into, but it quickly became apparent when we reached the FOB that several units from various branches had been mobilized in short order. As we stood in the cluttered briefing room, none of us, neither my unit nor the others, was prepared for what we would hear. We were informed that three groups specializing in advanced mountain warfare had been running a training drill in the general vicinity when one of the teams radioed in that they could hear automatic weapons fire from one of the group's last known positions. A helo was soon dispatched to see what was happening since they weren't cleared for any kind of expenditure of ammunition that the other group had reported. After an extensive air search, the helo failed to make contact with the group. It was decided that the second two groups would abandon their training mission and search for the missing group. An aerial search and rescue operation would commence immediately. The other two groups reported finding brass all over the group's base camp large amounts of blood, and several bodies all corroborated by the search and rescue team sent to retrieve the remains. It was decided the other two teams would track the remaining members of Group 1 that night. Both teams radioed in saying something was probing their lines and acting very aggressively. They made special mention in the transmission to say they didn't believe it to be of human origins. During the night, three more individuals went missing with no trace, it was decided to send helos up to pull them out. All 38 remaining members of groups 3 and 4 were in another room prepared to answer any questions we might have. We spoke with them at length, plotted out the first group's last known position, and planned our movements very carefully. The six units that had been brought in would be dropped at various places throughout the range. My unit would be dropped right at the group's base camp, and would track them with assistance from another unit, while two units would be job four in advance of our position and work their way back to us. Two other teams would investigate possible secure positions the group could have made their way to. The minute we were on the ground, we all knew this was no longer a rescue, but a recovery mission, or so we thought. As we moved deeper into the Sierra Nevada mountain range, we lost all trace of the first group, just as the other two groups had. On our first night out there, we were met with the most god-awful noises, screams, and growls. To be exact, we had Black Hawks searching for the source of the sounds as we crept deeper and deeper into the mountains. The only words spoken were between the radio operators of the six teams and the command at the base of the mountain. For 48 hours, we searched for the lost group, never finding any trace of them. On the third night, the two teams were sent to investigate possible secure positions the group could have gone. We were given direct orders to find them, the missing group, and kill whatever it was that was taking us out. The two teams sent ahead of us were ordered to hunker down and wait for the rest of us to regroup with them. Before going to look for the missing men nine hours later, all six teams made their way to the northwest, where it was believed the two men went missing. None of us knew exactly what we were facing. The entire range had an eerie quiet about it, both day and night. We all had the feeling we were being watched, yet we could find nothing when we went looking. We knew we weren't so much the hunter as the hunted. Whatever was out there with us knew the terrain. It toyed with us for several hours going so far as to let loose this hideous laugh. We caught our first break. One of the other teams came across several shredded MRE packets that were torn to pieces in what we assumed were the remains of a human thigh. For some inexplicable reason, whatever this thing has left a trail leading to a small ravine. We knew it wanted us to follow it and knew it had eyes on us. 
We split up into four teams. Two of us would follow the bait while the other two would attempt to outflank it. We reached the start of the ravine just after sunset and waited, not daring to walk blindly into this thing's ambush. As darkness claimed the entire range, the unit attached to my unit opened up on something creeping around our left flank. We quickly spread out and fired random single shots into the forest, pushing it right into our other units waiting to catch this thing. In a classic pincer maneuver, with our kill box set, we moved in only to find ourselves face to face with what I can only describe as the Sasquatch from hell. This thing stood almost 12 feet tall and as wide as an Abrams tank. Even with us going at it with everything we had this thing fought back ferociously killing an additional four men before finally going down. We didn't let up. We put our 203s to work launching enough HPS to melt the damn sun. Once we reported back, the thing was dead. Two Blackhawks, packed with guys in bio suits, showed up and took possession of what remains were left, and we were all picked up and flown back to the FOB. Once there, we were given specific orders to never discuss what happened and return to our individual commands. None of the guys in my unit has gotten much sleep since then. Truth be told, we take hunting terrorists over that thing any day of the week. During my 18-plus years military career, I have seen some strange occurrences. But this is by far the strangest. This occurred about 20 years ago when I was living in Juneau, Alaska. I was going through a really bad divorce. There was a lot of violence in the marriage and stuff, and the doctor had given me some medication to help me sleep. Now I was lying in bed on my stomach when all of a sudden I felt a very heavy pressure sit on the side of the bed right next to me. I tried to get up. Well, I was concerned that it was my soon-to-be ex-husband had gotten into the house and was sitting next to me. I was trying to turn around to see, but I couldn't. Then all of a sudden I heard a woman laugh. Like a woman who was a really heavy smoker, and she continued laughing. Very gravelly sounding, or that's what I call it. I tried to sit up again, and it was like she flung herself back on top of me. She was just laughing and laughing. So I reached my arm around, and I grabbed the hair on the head, and I pulled it. And the head literally popped off. It hung by the hair, and I looked at it. It was a very wrinkled, old face. I fainted. I just totally blacked out for a short time, but I soon came back to consciousness. My dog was whimpering and sniffing at me. I knew then that I wasn't imagining it. I noticed that there was a clump of hair in my hand. The head had disappeared. I wanted to throw them away, you know, throw them out. But then I thought, I'm going to put them on the nightstand, and so I did. I don't know why I did so. I sat up in bed for a long time. Finally, the dog calmed down and fell asleep. So I went back to sleep. It was weird because I felt so calm and relaxed. I woke up the next morning and I remembered what had happened and I looked over to the dresser where I had put the hair. They were gone, but I was so very terrified. I know what happened, but feared that the old hag would return. All these years later, the old hag never came back. I can tell you the exact year and month this happened. It was in 1979 in April that my own battalion received orders to ship out for the USMC Recruit Depot in San Diego, California. I was in Weapons Company of the 2nd Battalion 9th Marine at Camp Lejeune in Jacksonville, North Carolina. After my basic training in Paris Island, South Carolina, and infantry training at Camp Jiger, I had become a rifleman assigned to the 3rd platoon of the Lima Company. When we left for San Diego, it took a day and a half by train to get there, most of us having never been outside California's borders before, so this was an adventure. Once our arriving in California at MCRD, I had my first taste of real fighting from some Marine Corps drill instructors. Once I made it through the MCRD hell. I shipped out to Camp Pendleton for further training before being assigned a unit. 
That is when I met Mr. Bill. What is strange about this story is my past experience with large flying creatures had me slightly prepared for what was coming next. I have never ever read or seen any type of large flying reptilian creature in any science fiction movie or story, but I have read about and seen a pterodactyl one time before. This was during my high school years when I went on a field trip with a bunch of classmates to the local museum, and in the huge atrium, there was a very old mounted wingless pterodactyl on display. I think it had been there for at least 20 years, maybe more before I saw it. The thing was sitting upright on its tail, wings spread out to the sides of its body, like some type of prehistoric leathery aircraft. It looked like something off of a low-budget science fiction film set or prop. It really gave me the heebie-jeebies because here was this monster that lived and died during prehistoric times. It was scary just looking at it. So, of all that, it made my first experience with Mr. Bill's little baby pterodactyl less disturbing to me than it might have been to somebody else who had never seen something like that before. All Marines in my battalion had been seeing these things too. I know because they resembled somewhat of the pterodactyl that I saw with Mr. Bill. Sometimes you'd see them flying around during dusk, off in the far distance. Other times they'd be higher up towards the mountains, but they were unmistakable to see. But more on that in a minute. Back to my story about the Marine Corps Recruit Depot. It was around the first week of May when myself and a bunch of fellow Marines were on the parade ground, more or less waiting for something or other. We were all lined up at attention, not moving much at all except for some shifting, and just then I happened to glance in the direction of a very distant mountain about a mile or two away. And there, in the air high above, something caught my attention. I figured it was a bird, but it was so large, but when it made a big lazy U-turn and came back in our direction, I could not believe what my eyes had seen. The thing was huge, a large winged reptile, but you could see that it looked nothing like a bird due to its size alone. The wingspan was three times the normal size of a condor. I looked around to see if anybody else saw what I was seeing, but everybody's eyes were straight down in the position of attention so they could not have been looking anywhere else except for a head towards the drill instructor up on his little platform. It was then that I figured out the only reason why the D had not said anything about the giant flying thing in the sky was that he probably saw it too. I just happened to look up in its direction and needed to come back around, headed into our general direction again, coming from behind a very tall barracks building. It came closer until it passed overhead, right above where we were all standing at attention on the parade grounds. I could see it all very clearly. It was a huge creature with bat-like wings and a long skinny tail. The whole encounter could not have lasted for more than a few seconds, but it flew off towards the mountains again. I'll never forget the direction and the general outline of what I had seen and how it looked nothing like any type of bird at all that I've ever seen in my life. This was the very first time all of us saw one. Even the locals and natives there recognized them and even talk about them. If there's ever a place that Jurassic Park exists, it's there in Papua New Guinea. My cousin and I had just finished eating dinner and playing a round of golf. It was June 21, 2012 in Superior, Wisconsin. We were driving on a two-lane road that leads back into the east side of our city. As we turned right at a corner that led back into the main road, we drove another 100 feet until on the right side of the road, I saw an eight, nine-foot figure that was walking back into the edge of the forest located under a street light. I immediately hit the brakes, unsure of what I saw. My cousin who was in the passenger seat looked as shocked as I was. I yelled, I think that was an alien. The car came to a stop and my cousin yelled, go, go, go. I sped up and my eyes were tearing up as I couldn't believe what I had just seen. My cousin said, I thought I was seeing things. I replied, no, I saw it too. We drove to our apartment, which was nearby, still shocked and startled. I immediately called some friends. 
They came and picked me up and drove us back to the spot where I saw the figure. I explained what happened to them, and when we drove back to the location some brush looked to be parted where something had walked through it. I made the call to the local authorities. The figure stood eight, nine feet tall and had a tall, rounded, crown, crown-shaped head. The head was as big as a human abdomen. The figure was somewhat muscular-looking. It had big eyes, but not stereotypical alien-like, long legs, and it did not seem started whatsoever. The winding river beckoned to me, its gentle current promising a tranquil journey through the heart of nature. Canoeing had always been my solace, a way to escape the demands of the modern world and find peace in the embrace of the wilderness. This particular river trip was one I had undertaken many times before, each venture offering new discoveries and moments of reflection. As I embarked on the familiar route, the rhythm of paddling and the soothing sounds of the water against the canoe's hull became a meditative symphony. The sun's warm rays danced on the water's surface, creating a shimmering path that seemed to lead me deeper into the heart of the woods. The highlight of this journey was the 125-mile portage through the dense forest. It was a challenging stretch that required strength and determination, but the sense of accomplishment upon reaching the other side always made it worthwhile. As I shouldered my canoe and began the trek through the woods, I marveled at the towering trees and the earthy scent of the undergrowth. Only a few miles from the town, where a quaint motel and a taxidermy shop were the main places to stay, I relished the feeling of being far removed from the bustle of daily life. The tranquility was almost palpable, a precious commodity in a world that never seemed to stop moving. However, my idyllic journey took an unexpected turn as I trudged along the portage trail. I had become attuned to the sounds of the forest, the rustling of leaves, the distant calls of birds, and the occasional scurrying of small animals. But on this day, something felt different. The air was still, and an eerie silence hung in the atmosphere. It was then that I noticed movement out of the corner of my eye. A group of children emerged from the woods, their presence unsettling against the backdrop of nature. They moved with an uncanny silence, almost as if they were gliding rather than walking. Their sudden appearance caught me off guard, and I watched as they regarded me with curious, almost calculating eyes. The feeling that washed over me was reminiscent of a scene from a thriller, a sensation that one might experience when encountering the unknown in the midst of wilderness. The deliverance vibes were palpable, and a shiver ran down my spine as a strange sense of unease settled in my gut. The children's gazes lingered on me for a moment before they turned and, without a word, retreated back into the woods from which they had come. The sight was so surreal, their departure so swift, that I felt as though I had stumbled upon a secret realm inhabited by enigmatic beings. As they disappeared into the forest, my heart pounded in my chest, and instinct took over. Without a second thought, I hurriedly set my canoe down and began making my way back in the direction I had come from. The once familiar path now seemed foreign and foreboding, each rustle of leaves and distant sound magnified by my heightened senses. My pulse didn't return to its normal rhythm until I was back in my canoe, paddling furiously down the river away from that eerie encounter. The beauty of the surroundings, which had previously filled me with a sense of serenity, now seemed tainted by an unshakable feeling of unease. It was with a mix of relief and trepidation that I finally reached the town and spotted the familiar motel on the riverbank. The sight of civilization was like a bomb to my frayed nerves, a reminder that I had returned from the unknown and into the realm of the familiar. As I docked my canoe and stepped onto solid ground, I couldn't help but glance back at the woods I had emerged from. The memory of those silent, Curious children lingered in my mind, a puzzle piece that would forever remain unanswered. And as I walked past the taxidermy shop, I couldn't shake the feeling that I had narrowly escaped a brush with something otherworldly on that seemingly ordinary canoe river trip. Back in the 1980s, 
I was stationed in Prague, Czechoslovakia within the US military. I came home to visit my family for Christmas, and while at their house, me and my stepfather got into a heated argument about politics, of all things. At one point, he said something that really pissed me off so much, I decided not to stay any longer. It would only lead to trouble between his bones. So after spending some time with him, I walked up the door on him without giving any notice or saying goodbye to anybody else in my family. My wife was busy at work when this happened, so she did not have an opportunity to say goodbye either. This was around 4 p.m. in the evening. I began walking on the street where my car is parked, just a few blocks away. As I'm walking along, I hear this very loud whooshing sound directly overhead. At first, I thought it was maybe a helicopter, as this thing had passed overhead or at least on coming, but it sounded nothing like one. The noise this thing reminded me of was what you'd hear like if you took a time-lapse recording for maybe an aircraft carrier or something similar. It sounded as though there were multiple engines within the object as well due to the various levels of pressure coming from different directions, which kind of created an oscillating effect that shook everything below it. Adding to this deafening sound, the closer it came, in order for me to understand what this was, I ran as fast as I could to my car, threw it in reverse, and started speeding up to the street to get back onto the main highway. As I'm pulling out of the parking spot on that side of the street, I see it for the first time. This thing flies right across my windshield and overhead. My first thought was, oh no, because now that it's close up, I can see this thing has a distinct human form. And although its body seems elongated and muscular like an athlete or something similar, it had wings on its arms which made me think of a bat, but without fur or any feathery appendages. It also had legs with feet so large that from the distance I sought I would have never believed it for real had I not seen this with my own eyes. As this thing was flying overhead, it turned its head and looked right at me with a very menacing glare that totally said, I see you. I'll never forget the feeling of being busted for doing something wrong by somebody old enough to be your father. That's what this thing felt like, and it had a long protruding snout kind of like a beak or maybe an anteater or something similar, and very large orbish black eyes. Its skin and face were also very pale. When I drove off, I looked back to see where it went. The thing was gone, just like a ghost. I never knew they were in this area until after my encounter with them, but I read about similar sightings happening online. This really surprised me at the time. I never saw anything like it or even heard anybody else talk about them until now. Now that I know about their existence, I'm talking about gargoyles. It was a few years ago, but I was camping near a beach with some friends for a couple days and one night. God knows what I was thinking. I decided to go for a walk by myself well after 12 in the middle of January. While I was hiking through the woods toward the beach, I kept hearing some sort of humming, strumming sound, but didn't think much of it, so I pressed on. As I kept going, deer were running my direction, and I guess didn't see me or didn't care because they kept getting real close and started to freak me out. But I stupidly kept going. Eventually the humming sound got louder and I started to see what I assumed was a lantern and figured it was some other campers so I tried to quiet myself as much as I could and go around their clearing. As I got closer I learned that I was so wrong. The lantern I saw was a bonfire roughly the size of a car and the humming was about 20-30 half-naked old people rubbing some kind of powder on their chests and foreheads. They were all dancing around the fire and humming, chanting while one of them just strummed the same three chords on a broken-looking guitar. Needless to say, I was spooked to all hell, so I started to backpedal as slowly and quietly as I could. When one of them, an older guy with some feathery necklace, looks right at me, waves, and says, Oh, hey there, young fella. Why don't you come join us and warm up a bit? I'm sure you're cold with just that jacket. Let the flames and ash show you the warmth nature has provided for us tonight. 
I ran my ass as fast as I could through the woods, and I made sure to take as many detours as I could before going back to camp, because I swear I heard them following me. I know they called out after me while I was running. The second I got back I pulled out our hatchet and woke up the other guys just in case. They didn't believe me at first, but eventually they did and none have slept the rest of the night. We did end up seeing them the next day, and I can add that story if people request it. But anyway, thanks for reading. Part 2. Since my odd late night adventure got me, and everyone else, pretty spooked we decided to move our campsite further away from the clearing, where I saw all the weird shit and closer to one of the rocky out coves by the beach. It must have been around 5 or so because we could start to see the sunrise so we figured that would be the best time to pack up and move. Traveling to the water was fine. We didn't hear anything, but we did come across some ash piles close to where we were camping and used them to direct ourselves the opposite direction. Eventually, we made our way to the cove and set up camp around some boulders and a washed up canoe. While we setting up, we heard some twigs snapping and hoped it was just deer making their way through the woods. But of course it wasn't. The sound was too consistent to be more than a couple deer. It was the old people. I immediately hid down behind the boulders and peeked through the brush, while most of my friends did the same or hid under the canoe. I watched the old people as closely as I could without getting spotted this time, and didn't see anything too interesting other than some kind of ceremony they held. Now I don't know what religion it was, but they all stood in a line in front of the older guy from the last post. The older guy had a picture frame next to him with what I assume was another older person in the photo. Couldn't tell 100% from where I was. The older guy was holding a bowl of ashes and each person in line held either a flower, feather, or large leaf. Each person would take turns going up to the older guy with their object. The older guy would then take it, dip it in the ashes, rub it on their faces, mouths, chest, and hands before giving it back to them. After each person received their object, they would walk a few feet and stand in the sunlight motionless until every other person had done the same. None of them would sit. None of them would move. They just stood there. Eventually, when the older guy did the same to himself, he stood in front of them with his back turned to them and slowly lifted his arms like the Dark Souls guy. Each of the other old people did the same, and after a couple minutes, each person proceeded to put their blessed object in their mouth or hair, but most preferred the prior. My friends and I must have spent an hour or two watching them do this until they all started walking back into the woods silently. We still don't know what they were doing, but we like to look back and laugh on how weird it was. Thanks for listening, Horror Cowboys. See you tomorrow at the same time.